Welcome to today's program titled Securities Litigation and DNO Insurance Leading Experts Discuss Emerging Issues. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the text box on your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down. It will not be reread and it is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Gina Ferrari. Gina, you may begin. Good morning, everyone. This presentation has been prepared by Cypher Shaw, LLP, for informational purposes only. The material discussed during this webinar should not be construed as legal advice or a legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The content is intended for general information purposes only, and you are urged to consult a lawyer concerning your own situation and any specific legal questions you may have. We also note that the views expressed today are those of the individuals and not the organizations that employ them. While you may type in questions during the presentation. We'll endeavor to answer those at the end of this presentation, and if that's not possible due to time constraints, we will endeavor to reach back out to you and answer your questions in the coming days. And with that, I will kick it off to my partner, Greg Markell. Greg, are you on mute? Yeah, so this is Greg Markell. Um, I am the chairman of the litigation department of Cypress Shaw's New York law office. I am a co-chair of the securities litigation practice and chairman of the, of the Center for Corporate Governance at the New York County Lawyers Association. Uh, next, uh, I will, Priya Huskins, is the senior is a senior vice president, partner, uh, and management liability editor, uh, and at um, at Woodruff Sawyer and uh, Nash, and she also edits a DNO notebook blog. Kevin Lacroix is an attorney and executive vice president of RT Pro Exec. Uh, Pro Exec, a division of RT Specialty. Kevin uh, is frequently quoted in the New York Times and other publications and is editor of the DNO Diary. Gina Ferrari is a partner in Cypher Shaw's commercial, uh, commercial litigation practice in San Francisco and does a wide variety of uh, complex litigation and is a trial lawyer uh, uh, with great experience. <clears throat> uh, Jared Schlesinger is Executive Vice President of North American Financial Lines at Chubb, uh, and he has also, for Chubb, overseen the public manage company management liability business within North American Financial Lines. So those, that, is the, that is a quick by a quick description of the positions that the panel holds. Uh, bio, bios are, are, were available in connection with, by link with the original invitations. Um, the first, the first uh, topic is, uh, a, is the year in review topic on the agenda. Uh, and we're going to ask uh, Kevin LaCroix to cover that topic. Um, 
Kevin's uh, September entry on his blog of look what's next for uh, for uh, B&O in the marketplace and also in terms of claims. Um, that article inspired this panel, and uh, we I've asked him to please give us an, an overview of where he sees things going, and he'll be giving some idea of uh, some of the topics that will be covered in the uh, in this in this uh, program. Kevin, thanks, Craig, and hello, everyone. Um, I think it's fair to say, and everyone on this, this line can appreciate that 2020 has been an eventful year um, with significant developments on a wide variety of fronts. Many of these developments have had significant implications for corporate and securities litigation. And as we'll discuss a little bit later in the session, even the global pandemic has led to an assortment of a coronavirus outbreak related DNO claims. Um, the second biggest story of the year, the racial justice movement and the Black Lives Matter movement has led to significant legislative developments and litigation that will affect corporations and their boards. There's been a wide variety of other developments that have affected the you know, claims environment, um, including issues such as privacy, data security, corruption, trade sanctions, and a host of other issues that time may not allow us to get to today. There are a lot of ways we can look at these year's events. One way is to look at litigation activity, specifically securities class action litigation activity. The pace of securities litigation filing activity is a measure that most of those, those of us in the you know, insurance arena follow closely since securities litigation is by far the most important source of insurance losses for publicly traded companies. Gina, if you can move to the next slide. So uh, I, first of all, I'd like to thank Nira for um, uh, allowing me to use this information. Um, this bar graph is familiar, I'm sure, or at least some version of it to uh, many of you in the audience. It shows by year the number of securities class action lawsuit filings. And I should add, these are federal court securities class action lawsuit filings. Um, and you can see that uh, it, over the course of the years, it, it ebbs and flows. Um, but um, the most striking thing is um, there's been a general trend in the last several years towards um, higher levels of activity. Um, the last three years, 2017 to 2019, saw record levels of securities class action uh, lawsuit filings uh, exceeded only by the anomalous year of 2001 when the filing total was inflated by the IPO laddering litigation, which was basically just the same lawsuit filed 300 times. Accepting only that 2001 anomaly, there were more security suits filed during the 2017 to 2019 period than any other prior year in the, in the slides, in the data. Um, uh, most of the rise in those three years, or much, I should say, much of the rise in those three years, um, starting in 2016 actually, has been a shift of merger objection litigation from state court to federal court, and that explains some of the um, significant increase during 2017, 2018, 2019. Um, and that's important because I want to talk about uh, 2020 as reflected in this chart, uh, the filing pace in the first half of this year dropped off below the levels of the last three years. The 175 federal court securities class action lawsuits in the year's first six months project to a year end total of 350 um, as reflected on this slide which would be 16% below uh, 2019's year-end total of 421. There are a number of reasons I think we can all can, can conjecture about the reason for that drop-off in the first six months. One is the merger activity has been such an important part of securities litigation over the last three years, but during the end of the first quarter and um, much of the second quarter, merger activity uh, dropped off, um, which resulted in a drop-off in merger objection litigation. Also, there, were, um, there was the impact of government stay-at-home orders and even some court closures, some um, key courts. And so those um, seemingly obvious considerations may well explain some or all of the apparent lull in the first six months. But the question is, was it just a lull, or will um, filing activity return to the pace of the last three years? Is there something longer term going on? Uh, by my calculation, at the end of the third quarter, so no three quarters of the way through 2020, 
year-to-date numbers, we're still about 13% below the end of the third quarter of 2019. So the year-over-year difference has diminished slightly, but the uh, pace of federal court filings is still overall well below last year's pace. And I'm guessing the difference will remain at year's end. Only time will tell if the apparent drop in security suit filings was temporary or proves to be longer term. Either way, though, it's important to note that this year's filing pace, while below the level seen during the period 2017 to 2019, it still remains elevated compared to historic levels and well above long-term averages. So even if the loan proves to be um, have a longer-term significance, it's unlikely to have a significant impact on the current hard market for DNO insurance that we will be talking about a little later on. So back to you, Greg. Those were my remarks. So uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, Kevin, uh, so I'm talking about initially um, mootness fees and m and but I'm going to start in a different place. Uh, in the early period, early, early in the period starting around 2012, there were large numbers of merger lawsuits filed. Um, which were resolved with disclosure-only settlements. Um, as the, the decade came went along, uh, a larger number of courts realized that uh, much of many of the disclosures in connection with disclosure-only settlements of M&A cases um, were were not meaningless, and the courts in Delaware put a uh, an end to the friv to frivolous M&A lawsuits uh, that were designed to end in disclosure-only settlements, uh, and that was lar that was in a series of cases culminating in tr the Trulia case. Uh, the plaintiffs initially uh, reduced the number of, of of filings of merger cases shortly after Trulia. And then uh, we saw the emergence of a newer, a new and even more egregious, uh, egregiously baseless set of claims. And those claims um, are uh, now are merger claims in the context frequently of 14A of the Securities Exchange Act. Um, and what have and what we've seen is a group of law firms that have filed large numbers of these cases uh, and then dismissed them because they're dismissed in, as part of this routine before there is a determination of whether a class would be certified there there are no there's no judicial review of the settlement because it's neither a class action that has been a class that has been certified, nor is it a derivative action typically. Uh, these these cases uh, have gotten completely out of hand, and so w we did some research, and my partner uh, Daphne Morduchowitz did some research in the Stanford uh, database, and has learned that this year alone there have so far been 106 federal securities cases, M&A cases filed, uh, mostly six section 14A claims. 82 of those claims this year alone were filed jointly by the firms of Rigorsky and Long and RM Law. Uh, all but one of those were filed in Delaware District Court 53 of the 82 cases filed by Rigorsky and Long and RM Law have already been voluntarily dismissed. Uh, some of the, there are six still pending. And so, and there are a few other cases filed by other law firms, uh, such as Prodsky and Smith, uh, Weiss Law, and Monteverdi. Um, so what we're seeing is a, a derivative of the old disclosure-only settlements 
and those settlements uh, are clearly done simply so that the lawyers could get fees and no judge ever, in most cases, there are some exceptions, but in most cases, the judges never review them. So the result is that for the DNO world, there are legal fees that have to be paid for the for a defense. Uh, there are expenses associated with these cases and the legal fees that are paid in settlement are often covered. So this uh, means of replacing the, the uh, business for uh, these plaintiffs' firms that was put was put to an end largely by Trulia has been replaced with mootness fee cases, and uh, they really are uh, as the 53 voluntary dismissals uh, so far this year demonstrate a lot of them were clear were pretty clearly of little or no merit uh and so one of the thing one of the areas of of uh, reform of the securities laws that that uh needs to be addressed are these mootness fee cases um very very few of the best plaintiffs firms would uh support these cases as being uh legitimate in general. And so, you know, there really is very little, there's very little support or that can be said in defense of them. Um, so, uh, the, the, next, uh, the next part of this section is a discussion of uh, merger litigation in the DNO world. And I'm gonna hand the ball back to Priya for that. Um, so actually, what I was going to talk about very specifically is SPACs. And um, unless you are living under a rock, and even then, you know that there is enormous, there's an enormous amount of SPAC activity on the fundraising side right now. Um, in 2018, 20% of IPOs were SPAC related. In 2019, it was 28%. And I think we've all seen that in 2020, it's 42%, I think, through August, IPO activity being SPAC related. So really an astonishing increase in a very short period of time. Um, and for those carriers on the line that are writing DNO insurance for SPAC IPOs, there's some really good news. There's no IPO related suits to date at all, at least none that I can find. And if somebody finds one, please send it to me immediately. Um, so that S-1 registration statement litigation has been non-existent. Um, but what you can already see is M&A suits. And when you review SPAC-related litigation, it is all about the DSPAC transaction, all about the M&A activity. So I wrote an article that uh, the business section of the ABA published in which I analyzed different types of SPAC litigation, including the potential of S-1 litigation. And it is so notable that the litigation we have is M&A related, and there are two types. And the first is the type, Greg, that you were talking about. It's challenge suits, it goes away for mootness fees, um, you know, query whether it is the same law firms that are doing the operating company M&A challenges that result in mootness fees, that would be something interesting to find out. Um, but we see those and they are certainly very irritating, um, but probably not super expensive um, compared to the other type, which is the situation where there's M&A, the target does poorly, and now suddenly you have major litigation. Um, the ones that we've seen to date, and there haven't been a ton to date, but there have been some, um, they tend to arise at the end of the SPAC's life cycle. And so maybe that's a time when people are a little bit anxious about not having a failed SPAC. Maybe that anxiety leads to a scotch of sloppiness. Who can say? That's certainly sometimes the allegations are much worse than that. Um, and it's just in the spirit of thinking about emerging issues, when you have so much capital being raised, chasing after deals in a short period of time. And, you know, I share Chairman 
of the SEC, Jay Clayton's view that it's nice to have an alternative to IPOs for the path to going public. Um, that's probably good overall for the market. And yet, you know, there can just be no doubt that as we look off into the future, there is some chance that we're going to see elevated levels of legitimate M&A related litigation related to these DSPAC transactions that for the class of 2020 will have to take place in the next 18 to 24 to maybe a little bit after that with extension months. Um, so that, that will be something for all of us to watch. And I think um, unless anybody has a comment on that from the panel, I will turn it to Jared and Gina to talk about COVID-19. When the pandemic began earlier in the year, uh, there were many predictions about there being a wave of COVID-19 related DNO claims. And uh, to date, we've seen approximately 20, maybe 21 by Kevin's count, who I, I rely on for the accuracy of the count. Um, and it, frankly, with 21 over the last eight or nine months, that's a lot lower than as compared to securities cases being filed with other global crises, for example, the financial crisis in 07 and 08. Um, and frankly, there was also um, a break in the filings of these cases. So between August and October, we didn't see any COVID filings. Our most recent COVID filing was this month. And again, it was uh, against a cruise line. So if you, if you look at these approximately 20 cases, what are they about? You can generally put them in three categories. One category are COVID outbreak cases. These are, these are the cruise ships, these are the prisons. This is where um, there's been misstatements about health and safety, uh, specifically, as we've seen in the three cruise line cases, you know, promises that taking a cruise would be safe. We've also seen public statement cases. These cases are typically around uh, promises that a vaccine will be developed, rapid testing is actually working, and or that PPP is being distributed or coming through supply chains. The other cases are really um, misstatements or omissions related to revenue and operations. These are typically overstatements about a product, a misstatement about PPP loans, um, and we have a few M&A cases in there, misstatements about a merger actually potentially going forward and or misstating financials that are related to how the company is performing, including in acquisition cases, uh, misstatements in financials in advance of acquisitions. We know that the SEC is interested. We know that the, uh, as early as late March, they issued guidance stating that disclosures for public companies affected by COVID-19 would be required under the securities laws. And we've seen a few enforcement actions uh, taken, and, and we know that the SEC has been speaking quite frequently on uh, putting resources in and really looking at um, what people are reporting vis-a-vis -vis their finances and operations. So going forward, I agree with Kevin's most recent statements, which are, where are we going to see COVID-19 cases as the year ends and we move into 2021? It's likely to be in this third category, the revenue and operations cases, uh, especially as companies start to perf uh, open up again, hopefully not open and close, but open up again. And there will be optimistic and aspirational statements about how well the companies will do. And uh, as Priya will discuss later, as we've seen it become easier for plaintiffs to prove Fairmark claims, there's really a risk that these, these statements of um, optimism and how the company is going to succeed will be the basis for securities class action. Yeah, uh, Gina, Jared. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, from our perspective, 
when we look at these kind of claims and how and how they've happened so far, um, you know, I think we would, you know, we think we're still in the early stages. So when you talk about these comments and these disclosures that are going to be made, whether it's relating to back to work, back to business, uh, revenue production, um, you know, there's going to be missteps, right? There's a lot of room for there to be missteps there. Um, and uh, we've never really been in this kind of situation before, where we've had this sort of pandemic in the modern, you know, modern years. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's really possible that COVID and everything that goes along with it could go away tomorrow. Uh, but the ability to see lawsuits stem from it could continue on for, for a pretty long time thereafter as comments get made by, by companies uh, publicly about what they're expecting to see. Um, you know, as it relates to, to you know the COVID-related claims, I think we, you know, I, I kind of put it into, you know, the three buckets you put in, but also two other kind of categories. And I think you need to look at the direct category, which are the three that you just talked about. Um, but I also like to focus on the indirect claims that are likely to come as a result of COVID as well. Uh, for example, you know, we're going to see an influx, and we already have seen an influx in bankruptcies, a lot in the energy space, the retail space. Hospitality and travel. Um, you know, so we're, we're definitely expecting to see, uh, you know, a, an influx of cases surrounding that as well. Um, I think it's really hard. I think it's really hard uh, for, for the uh, for the industry um, and the industry publications to track those to say which ones are COVID related and which ones are not COVID related. I think it's very easy when the allegations are, are very specific to COVID, but I think it gets a lot harder. Uh, when you have that sort of um, indirect uh, happenstance. Um, you know, I think we're going to see um, potentially more derivative claims as well. Um, just from the, uh, people are going to be saying things and people are going to be doing things and people have taken actions. Um, and I think it's right for second guessing. And I think when you have that second guessing, that makes it right for, uh, for derivative claims. Um, so, you know, I think when we talk about it, you know, we're we're really potentially hopefully in the later stages from a health perspective um, as it relates to, to COVID. But I think we may unfortunately be in the early stages uh, of how it impacts litigation on a go forward basis. And then the, the other point I wanted to make was when we're talking about um, the COVID cases, we tend to focus a lot on security class action and DNO. But I think there's also a potential that this kind of bleeds into the other management liability lines, uh, you know, the employment practices with back to work, you know, who got furloughed, who didn't get furloughed, you know, bringing people back to work, who you're bringing back, when you're not bringing them back, discrimination type cases uh, that are likely to be COVID related as well. Um, cyber, you know, it, it, cyber is harder to control in a re remote environment. So I think we're likely to see more cyber claims. And as we know, cyber claims and cyber incidences may lead to further DNO claims. Uh, even crime, you know, social engineering is harder to police in this environment. It's harder to put, uh, uh, control a company that's widespread in this environment. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I keep focusing on um, uh, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld said, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And I, unfortunately, I think that's sort of where we are in, in this stage uh, of the COVID environment. Jared, this is Kevin. I, I just want to jump in with one comment. Um, I agree with you about bankruptcies. Um, we have seen a number of bankrupt all, bankruptcies already. Um, I just checked the American Bankruptcy Institute statistics, and as of the end of the third quarter of 2020, the number of uh, Chapter 11 business bankruptcies was a third higher than the same point a year ago. So we are seeing more than a year ago. But a lot of those bankruptcies, particularly for the larger retail uh, companies and, and um, other um, high-profile enterprises, those have been workouts where you know they've been collaborative, where creditors are cooperating. My concern is this drags on, that spirit will diminish and there'll be more uh, companies getting pushed into bankruptcy, particularly if Congress doesn't get around to passing another stimulus package. You know, the impact of this stimulus package passed earlier this year and the forbearance by creditors up to this point, um, that has muted, muted, muted the uh, impact of bankruptcy. But I think there's a genuine risk that um, the, the worst is yet to come, particularly as the health crisis drags on. And as I said, if, if Congress does not soon pass another stimulus package, we could see um, more rampant bankruptcies, um, particularly for companies that have been trying to string along and hoping they can get back to normal at some point. Um, and, and I think that has significant implications for the likely future claims. So 
I just want to echo what you said, Jared, that I, I think that the worst may be yet to come, but it may not be the securities class action lawsuits. It may be adversarial proceedings in the bankruptcy context. It may be um, mismanagement lawsuits brought against former directors and officers of bankrupt companies. Um, and time will tell whether that happens and how significant it, it will be if it does happen. No, that's a, that's, that's, those are great points, Kevin. Thank you. And you know, I don't know if you had more on this topic or we should pass this on uh, to, the, to the next topic. None for me. Why don't we go uh, to board yeah, and go, board. go ahead, Gina. All right. So as many of you know, the marketplace has seen an increased dialogue elevating purpose with profit. Um, if this is uh, now moved into what's called ESG, it's the historical corporate social responsibility, E being environmental, S being social, and G governance. And it's, it's really elevated standards of corporate citizenship that cover a lot of topics, but really what they're doing is getting to the soul of the company and, and marrying these issues and aspects with business strategy. Uh, it's an approach to managing investment risk and assessing a company's long-term value, sustainability, and resiliency for many, many companies. Um, and it's shaped by institutional investor communities as, as well as the consumer. And while in the past it has been focused by um, community standards and consumer standards and some investor standards, we're really now seeing mandatory uh, requirements across a number of areas, including board diversity. Um, but that being said, there are also issues regarding human capital, the well-being, the fair and equitable pay, the health and safety of talent, talent development, management, and inclusion. The S in ESG also focuses on supply chain management, human rights, and labor standards. I would put data privacy and community and stakeholder engagement in the S in ESG as well. And there are different forces that are influencing this ESG dialogue. So uh, not just legislation, but we are also having investor side requirements and suggestions. So investors are sending letters to companies signaling that board diversity is one of the priorities for their portfolio companies. Uh, we are also seeing information requests by raters and rankers. Even proxy advisors are withholding recommendations on board nominations if there isn't diversity represented. So. Uh, who's leading the way in the legislation? Well, it, I know folks like to say that California is peculiar and special as a lawyer based in San Francisco, but a number of the board diversity issues actually didn't start here. Um, they began in the international community, and Colorado was the first state in 2017 to legislate either requirements or aspirations to have a diverse board focusing on gender. California followed soon thereafter. Uh, and per last year, there are disclosure requirements that have been considered by the federal government, uh, Illinois, Maryland, and New York on uh, gender diversity on a board. And just last month, or just this month, California added a mandatory requirement for underrepresented communities to be on the board. Washington added a requirement for gender diversity for boards. And we look forward to um, seeing laws that are in their state legislatures out of Hawaii, Massachusetts, and Michigan uh, regarding gender diversity on boards. So um, have there been challenges to the California statute. So the, the California statute for gender diversity on boards is SB 826. Um, for uh, racial and underrepresented persons diversity, that's AB 979. SB 826 came out um, in 2018. And there were two 
main law, uh, lawsuits, one in state court and one in federal court. The state court claim was filed by a conservative group um, alleging that taxpayer monies were improperly being used to by the California government to ensure compliance with the gender diversity law that had been passed through SB 826. That case uh, is still going forward. It was challenged and, based on standing and just in June, that case was allowed to go forward. It's in a discovery phase. It probably survives the standing challenge because California has a statute that gives taxpayers standing. The federal court case was filed by an Illinois shareholder in a company that had officers and executives in California. And the argument there was that that shareholder's voting rights were being impeded because, in his opinion, if he had to vote or only had the opportunity to vote for a woman for the board, it was keeping him from voting as he, he chose. Uh, in April, the East District of California said that the law actually did not impede his voting rights and he did not have standing. It was um, dismissed and now it's up on appeal. The same law firm that filed the state law claim for SB 826 almost immediately filed, again in Los Angeles Superior, a claim under AB 979. Now, when, when these cases were first filed, uh, there was some discussion about making an argument about violation of the Internal Affairs Doctrine uh, because the statute in California requires companies who are incorporated in other states but have principles in California to meet these requirements. Interestingly enough, uh, there have not been any internal affairs document, uh, doctrine arguments. We'll see how those proceed. Those cases are uh, in their infancy. We're really not seeing any industries wanting to step up and, and take on and challenge these statutes. And in fact, um, it looks like folks are, um, more states are going to come online, just like I stated previously. And uh, we know that the SEC came out um, in August and has also required human capital disclosures. Folks believe that the SEC didn't go far enough. Uh, they were quite vague in their guidance. What they said was, yes, you need to um, provide numbers of employees but as far as breaking down those actual numbers between uh, gender and race, those metrics aren't required. Um, really, the disclosures on human capital must be made if they're material, and they leave it up to each publicly traded corporation to decide what's material to their specific business, um, focusing indeed on what makes it material, the nature of your business, the nature of your workforce, the measures and objective, objectives for the development, attraction, and retention of a diverse workforce. So uh, we do have, as you can see, and as I've said, uh, legislation and regulations and guidance that are requiring board diversity, but we also have board diversity cases. We have, uh, I believe, at least eight now with the lion's share occurring in California. And, and these arise out of promises and or statements that have been made by boards to, uh, um, excuse me, companies to increase the diversity on their board, which has, according to these lawsuits, not yet happened. Um, these promises were made in their public filings and in press releases. So regardless of the legislation or regulations, we're going to see a, a shareholder and a societal push towards meeting these metrics for boards. And when we have McKinsey coming out and stating that profit is increased with board diversity, of course shareholders are going to argue in derivative suits that 
the corporation has the duty to increase their share price and therefore diversity should prevail and um, be at the forefront of issues for corporations. Priya, would you have anything to add to that background? Um, so I'm, I am personally fascinated by the rise, and I think we can broadly call this a version of stakeholder capitalism. And as your slide so, um, so rightly says, it is notable the rise of S in the ESG triad, particularly this year, especially after the events of Memorial Day. Um, and you know, seeing, no surprise, as you've noted, that we're seeing these derivative suits being filed originally, and for the diversity cases, and originally it was really just one law firm, um, but when Robin Geller gets into it, you've got to pay attention. So, you know, real um, serious challenges. Um, I, whenever there's a derivative suit, you always have pressure on the site A part of the you know, insurance, even though defense is not part of that. Um, and I think whenever you have a derivative suit, directors across the country go on high alert um, because they understand that those are in some sense much more personal. And I think that goes double for these diversity cases because it strikes at the core of people's um, reputation and you know has the ability to um, make well-meaning board members extremely uncomfortable as they are forced to defend the diversity or lack thereof of their board. Um, so they're very awkward. However, I don't think those board diversity cases will end up settling in the majority of situations for um, much money. And I'm going to do two asterisks on that. And one is, of course, Oracle already had a Department of Labor lawsuit that concerned the underpayment of minorities and women and had um, already had a big settlement with them. So they may be particularly vulnerable in a way that most of the defendants in these board diversity cases um, are not. And of course, everybody saw the press and um, as always, Kevin LaCroix um, did such a beautiful write-up on that Google settlement recently that was very hashtag me too related, uh, big dollars, though not at all clear that that's being funded by insurance based on their disclosure. Um, so, you know, I, I think for the most part, these diversity type cases, they're going to settle for corporate therapeutics and commitments. And, um, and I think they're serious, but I don't think they are costly except for defense, which is, of course, always costly. I think the real pressure on boards right now from a derivative suit perspective are Caremark claims. And Gina, you alluded to this, and to just be more specific here, the, the series of cases, um, Marchand, sometimes called Blue Bell Ice Cream, Clovis Oncology, Candy Technologies, you know, these are three cases that happened pretty quickly in 2019 um, in 2020 that may or may not be changing, but are certainly underscoring the current thinking in Delaware when it comes to duty of loyalty, good faith cases, uh, when it comes to corporate oversight. And you know, as I'm sure folks will remember who are listening to this webinar, the, the duty of loyalty, there are two prongs, right, when it comes to oversight. Did the board fail to implement a system of oversight at all? or did it consciously disregard the system? And just on its face, these do not seem like difficult standards. And in fact, I really don't think they are. And yet, you know, in the hustle and bustle of business, sometimes the, the case doesn't look good from the defendant's perspective. Um, I think where this becomes a big deal right now is, of course, as you alluded to earlier with COVID, um, because we know from this series of cases that I just mentioned that a board's failure to consider risks that have to do with health and human safety definitely will get a lot of attention from Delaware. And so, you know, COVID-19 is obviously just the bullseye target for that issue. And for that reason, I think you are so right. You and Jared are so right that we're going to see more cases around COVID-19 um, as we progress into going back 
uh, away from lockdowns and the like. But with respect to um, whether the, not again, not loosening, but perhaps underscoring what the Delaware court is expecting from boards as we think about that in the context of ESG, um, you know, I do think that you're going to see some increased pressure. And what I mean specifically is, and you, you said it well, the companies that have been sued in the diversity cases all made statements about what they were planning to do. And if a board allows such statements to be made, and it's not particularly health and human safety, but if they're having these statements and then a plaintiff can be quite creative and start thinking in terms of, well, you know, they said they were doing these things. Was there A, any system that was developed that was reasonably likely to tell the board if it was happening or B, were they consciously disregarding what the system was telling them that they had set up? You can see cases having a little bit more in terms of legs uh, than they otherwise would have. Um, and I don't think any of us would have said that in 2018. I think it's Bluebell in 19 and the other, uh, and Candy in 2020 that make us much more aware that um, these derivative suits are a bigger deal than they might have been before. Jared, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, so thank you. Um, a couple of things. I mean, I, I think the biggest thing that, you know, from my perspective is, you know, we're really just so early on in these cases and um, how they're going to play out, I think, is, is so unknown. Um, some of the some of the relief sought in, in these cases has been pretty far and, and broad reaching uh, in terms of creating plans for diversity and inclusion, return of compensation by the board, of requiring annual diversity reports being filed, um, uh, diversity training, chief diversity officer roles. They, they sort of run the gamut, but a lot of them have a creation of a large fund to promote the hiring and advancement of minorities. So, you know, how those are going to play out, and, and I think we're just really on the early side of this. And, um, you know, how are you going to defend these? You know, should you defend these? Uh, do you just settle? Uh, do you just settle for therapeutics quickly? You know, someone once joked with me about this, and it's not a joking matter, obviously, diversity and, and, and all this, but they said it's sort of like Perry Mason. You know, you're in court, Exhibit A, here are your mission statements about diversity. And most public companies have something out there about their, you know, their, their stance on diversity. Exhibit B, here are the headshots of your board, your board of directors, you know, I rest, Your Honor. You know, I, and so it's, you know, it's, it's got the potential to be very simple in the pleadings. Um, but I do agree that, you know, I think a lot of these, you know, really look at more for therapeutics than the financial. They've all been brought derivatively lately. Um, you know, we heard somebody speak about it, and, and they were talking about, well, there hasn't been any, you know, uh, stock drop that's been part of it. So I think, you know, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, you know, that maybe that does change at some point. I think, it's, again, it's just too early to tell. Um, I think from an underwriting perspective, the concern is, you know, how how can we underwrite to this? Um, you know, how do we how are we going to view this uh, as an underwriting community? Um, you know, I think, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but you know. I think companies should expect to answer questions about this during the underwriting process. Um, and, you know, I, the one thing that, that is interesting, and I think you, you guys brought up before, is, you know, they were predominantly brought by the same firm early on, but there is, um, there is a sense now that they're being brought by a different firm that's, you know, usually attaches itself to bigger, larger, more robust cases in terms of uh, looking for, for financial settlements. So, Again, I, you know, from our perspective, from my perspective, I should say, it, it, it's just really early stages, um, and, and you know, it's something that, as a community, as a, as a DNO community, whether you're on the legal side, the broker side, the client side, or the underwriting side, it's something you know, a we need to be concerned with, um, you know, from that perspective, but also as a society, we just need to be concerned with it. So, um, I don't know if if you guys had further comments on that. So uh, to stay on uh, on our schedule, if, unless somebody has uh, another comment on, on what has just been discussed, uh, I think it, we might move on to the cyan discussion. And Kevin, do you want to lead that off? I think Priya is going to lead that, Greg. And Priya, then, but Gina, are you? Priya should you, lead. Thanks. Nope. <laughs> thanks, Greg. Gina, do you want to give the CLE code? No problem. The CLA code for today's presentation is S, as in Sam, S9272, SS9272. 
9272. And with that, I give it to you, Priya. Thank you, Gina. Um, as I frantically write down the CLA code, we all love those codes. Um, so, Cyan Shabakuchi Restoration Robotics State Court Securities Class Action. This has been a very spicy area in the last couple of years. Um, you know, my my firm, Woodrow Sawyer, does a lot of DNO insurance for IPO companies nationally. Um, and particularly in California, which has been a, a very difficult hotspot for state court litigation. Um, and we collect a lot of data. And just to set some context here, you know, back in 2009, um, CardioNet had a 10B case that was dismissed, but in 2010, another group of shareholders, um, surprisingly, brought a Section 11 state court case that settled for $7 million, but, you know, one off silly things happen and nobody worries about it. And then suddenly in 2011, you had Pacific Biosciences um, and Vivio in 2012, Audience in 2012, I think Cafe Press was 2013, Model N in 2014. So again, these registration statement IPO cases weirdly being brought in California State Court, and then they settled in 2015 all at once for surprising amounts between six and ten million dollars. Obviously, the cost of defense covered by DNO policies as well. Hard not to notice that. I know carriers noticed it right away. I remember having a lot of conversations at that time, and the other people who noticed were the plaintiffs bar. And so in 2015, we went suddenly, we've got 14 Section 11 suits in state court, and it kept getting bad. And by April of 2016, I actually wrote a paper describing this uptick. I know Kevin had observed it as well. Um, at, you know, at that point, we all noticed that pricing for IPOs were going up. And just, um, you know, for the brokers on the line, everybody would get a chuckle when we all remember that in 2016, we were beside ourselves that $10 million for uh, DNO insurance for an IPO probably had a $1.5 million self-insured retention and was going for the astronomical number of $360,000. I think zero members of the carriers on the line will find that funny. Um, and I understand that given what ended up happening, but I, I bet all of the brokers who were doing DNO insurance for IPO companies at the time remember um, really struggling to explain to clients um, why it had, the prices had gone up. And I'm going to guess we all now look back on that with almost nostalgia. Um, but anyway, in that time frame, I had um, talked about three solutions. And one was win science. The second one had to do with lockups, and the third one had to do with the Grunfest solution, which ultimately was expressed in Shabu Cookie. Um, so that's now 2016, and let's talk about the Grunfest solution, because that started taking um, legs before the Cyan case um, was decided by the Supreme Court. So the idea that Professor Joe Grunfest, who is a professor at Stanford and a very big thinker about practical problems, his idea was that, you know, gosh, if you have plaintiffs who are suing, bringing Section 11 cases against registration statements in state court, hmm, at the time of the IPO, put a provision in that's an analog to state choice of forum provisions, um, but make it federal choice of forum provisions have something in the certificate of incorporation or bylaws that says basically plaintiffs we understand you may need to sue us on our registration statement but if you do it you can only do it in federal court and what's particularly elegant about that solution is that there is a federal court in all of the states so there's no argument that somehow is you know overly onerous arguably a federal choice of forum provision is less onerous than a state choice of forum provision for corporate law matters, which is has long at this point, I'm gonna use the phrase long been accepted even by California as something you can do. Um, so you started seeing IPO companies insert federal forum provisions, also known as the Grunfest solution, um, as they were going public, time moves forward um, and some, uh, three companies in January of 2018, um, very surprisingly, were sued by shareholders um, 
who said these Grunfest solution provisions were on their face, facially invalid as a matter of Delaware corporate law. Those three um, companies were Stitch Fix, Roku, and Blue Apron. And I, I personally was gobsmacked that any plaintiff would bother to bring a suit like that when there was no underlying litigation, no underlying Section 11 litigation. And my thought was, well, they would never, the plaintiffs would never do that because what if they lost? You, you know, you don't really want to risk losing what is a cash, has become a cash cow for them. Um, and I'm, I'm going to say that that was probably a bad idea on their part, but they didn't think so. So that was January 2018. And then in March of 2018, the Supreme Court ruled in Cyan. So Cyan was the case that went to the Supreme Court to resolve the, the, what was then a circuit split. So in the Ninth Circuit, plaintiffs were having a great time filing these Section 11 federal securities class action suits in state court, and we all saw that they were settling for big dollars. But in the Second Circuit, so New York, the New York state courts were kicking them to federal court saying this is not appropriate. That's a circuit split. That is actually what the Supreme Court is supposed to do. Um, and very disappointing what I would have thought was a business friendly Supreme Court in a unanimous decision agreed with California. Yeah, open for business state courts have at it. Um, so that was so disappointing. Um, and of course, what that meant is that one of the you know, three solutions that people were talking about was completely off the table. So now a lot of pressure on Delaware, hoping that the Chancery Court would find that the Brunfest solution worked in that case that was now pending against Stitch Fix, Roku, and Blue Apron. But the hits kept coming in December of 2019 um, the Chancery Court said, nope, facially invalid, you're out. Very disappointing. Um, and I have to say what followed is something that I'm enormously proud of as a member of the D&O you know, insurance industry. Um, but of course, it actually started with uh, my client Stitch Fix and their wonderful general counsel, Scott Darling, who agreed that, you know, gosh, while he didn't particularly want to keep paying for something since there was no underlying litigation, was willing to put the time in, certainly, to appeal this terrible decision in the Delaware Chancery Court. And everyone should remember that if they had not, if those three co-defendants had decided to refrain from appealing the case, which would have been reasonable, given that there was really nothing on the line for them by themselves, right, per se, we wouldn't have any path other than Congress. And I leave it to all of you to just decide for yourself if you think Congress is going to give us a solution here um, for what is just absurd levels of frivolous litigation. Um, but they agreed to do the appeal and several members of the insurance industry, including my firm, as well as Jared, thank you, Chubb, um, came together in a funding group that went ahead with Wilson Sonsini supported this appeal. Um, that was argued in January of 2020, which seems like 60,000 years ago right now, but it wasn't. It was actually this year. It was argued in front of the Delaware Supreme Court. And in a unanimous ruling um, in March of 2020, the Delaware Supreme Court said, yeah, this works. This is facially valid. Chancery Court, you were wrong. Um, and that is fantastic. And 100% of my clients immediately said, so are our insurance rates going to go down? And we had to say, well, this is a very important step, but we need, for example, a California state court to dismiss a Section 11 case for lack of jurisdiction based on these rulings. We need something to show, um, to discourage future plaintiffs from bringing this and to demonstrate that it works. Um, Restoration Robotics, actually another one of my clients as it happened, um, had had an IPO in October of 2017 and had been sued. And they were the ones who were first up, if you look at the queue, and there was a big delay because of pandemic, um, but they were first up in terms of getting a result on attempting a motion to dismiss based on federal forum provisions, the Grunfest solution. 
Um, I think many of us thought they had the worst possible draw because this was being um, argued in San Mateo court, which a lot of people have regarded as the epicenter of all of these problems, um, though I would point out all California courts were, were hearing these cases. Uh, in particular, a, a Judge Weiner, who was out in front on these issues, a former member of the plaintiff's bar, um, now a judge in San Mateo County, and in September of 2020, in a very long and frankly uh, unfriendly opinion, she actually granted the motion to dismiss because of federal forum provisions. And when you read that rather long opinion, um, you will find yourself seeing on the front page that Restoration Robotics won its motion to dismiss, but every two or three pages, you'll actually go back to the front to say like, wait a minute, they won, right? Um, because she wrote a very long opinion that stands for the proposition she did not want to grant the motion to dismiss. But to her credit, she did. Um, and that is a really big deal. There, now, that's one. It went the right way. It, does not, it is not binding precedent for any other California court or indeed any other state court. Um, but it is probably very persuasive, especially because it is Judge Weiner in San Mateo County Court. Um, I believe uh, Dropbox, which is another um, kind of similar situation, a motion to dismiss based on federal forum provisions that's going to be argued here either this Friday or next Friday. Um, so in fairly short order, we may find out if other California state courts agree with Judge Weiner's position. Um, and when they do, and I'm going to say when they do, that is a glorious thing. Because as you look at the data um, that Kevin and I and many, many others have examined, um, part of the unbelievable stress on the DNO insurance industry now is the Section 11 cases. And as a reminder, they're not limited to IPO cases. We've seen several state court Section 11 cases related to M&A as well when companies use their stock as currency to buy other companies. Um, so it's very consequential. Um, and I have to tell you, I'm thrilled to my toes that it seems to be going in the right direction, fingers and toes crossed that Dropbox goes the correct way as well. Uh, so I am clearly very enthusiastic about this situation. Um, it is something that I, I have a feeling the entire DNO insurance industry is watching. Um, but I'll stop there in case anybody else has comments about it, though I would ask, please don't burst my bubble before a court does. Kevin, Regina, you, you want, you want to yeah, I, I just, you know, I, I don't want to burst your bubble, Priya. Oh, you're going to burst um, my bubble. I can just. No, I'm not. Kevin, I'm not. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't want to do anything to um, challenge something that thrills you to your toes. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> I, you know, I do think that some perspective is important. It, it, it is really valuable for Delaware corporations who are sued in California state court. Um, and most U.S. listed companies are Delaware corporations, but not all are Delaware corporations. Many tech companies are incorporated in Nevada. Financial services companies are incorporated in New York. All REITs are incorporated in Maryland. Um, obviously, companies domiciled outside the United States, which represent 16% of the companies listed on the U.S. exchange, are uh, not Delaware corporations. So, you know, there are many companies that are listed on uh, in one of the U.S. exchanges that can't take advantage of the shadow cookie opinion because they're not Delaware corporations. And they will have to fight the fight of whether um, federal forum provisions are valid under the laws of the jurisdictions in which they are incorporated. And then, of course, as you pointed out, a, uh, a ruling by a state court in California, a state trial court in California, while a, a big win and um, certainly is thrilling for some of us in the insurance industry, is uh, not going to necessarily help you if the case is pending in New York or another jurisdiction. Um, and so th there are a lot of hurdles yet to be surmounted, and maybe they all will be someday. Um, really, the only thing at this point that can completely eliminate the cyan problem is uh, if Congress were to amend Section 22 of the 33 Act to eliminate concurrent jurisdiction, c concurrent state court jurisdiction. It could be very simply done. Um, Congress tried to do it once before in the PSLRA. 
Um, this really this is low hanging fruit, but Priya is right. The chance of this current uh, divided and distracted Congress doing something even this seemingly self-evident is, is unlikely. So unfortunately, there are going to be other milestones that have to be um, surmounted um, in order for the cyan problem to be fully addressed. And I, I hope that doesn't feel like I'm raining on your parade, Priya. I'm just <laughs> stating some things that I, I feel like everybody needs to appreciate to understand where we are. And of course, you are the voice of reason. Um, my balloon is not burst. Maybe a little helium let out, just a scotch. You have to start somewhere. And I think one of my, so absolutely everything you said is correct. Um, I would point out that there is it, there's this funny thing um, with foreign filers and um, also just non-Delaware corporations, um, you know, you, they can put the provision in. It's not clear that it will necessarily be challenged as a question of their organizing uh, jurisdiction corporate law. Um, so there is a there is there is some important and I don't say this in a flippant way gamesmanship to be considered for all companies, including mature public companies who themselves may do registered offerings, including debt securities. You know, the other thing I'd say is what's what's so fascinating about Cyan Shabukuki Restoration Robotics includes the fact that at you know Cyan obviously was just a disaster, um, but at every stage for um, the Delaware effort, something could have taken this off track, and so far really good even if Dropbox goes a different way from Restoration Robotics, and we all know the plaintiffs will appeal Restoration Robotics, at least this has survived long enough to continue to be a viable solution as opposed to just being strangled at a much earlier date. And so that makes me very hopeful. There are so many opportunities for this to get derailed and it's still on track. So I, I still, I feel, I'm gonna stick with thrill to my toes, Kevin, is what I'm saying but your, your points are well made. Gina, do you have any move thoughts? On to the next section. Yes, I'll just add that when, when Cyan came down, Greg and Kevin and I spoke on a webinar, and as the local attorney in San Mateo County, I expressed some concerns about if, whether these types of cases were brought in state court, whether or not we would get uh, defense rulings. And I was quite skeptical. So it's exciting to see Restoration Robotics uh, come out the way it did. Um, and we know that she was reluctant in issuing her <laughs> decision. Um, but it's better than Kevin and Greg and I predicted. Well, so, and we all have to start somewhere. So, <laughs> yay. <laughs> so with, with that, I'm I'm going to repeat the CLE code and uh, kick it off to Jared on the next topic. So, again, the CLE code is SS927. And Jared, it's... Yep. Thank you, Gina. Um, yeah, just, just on the cyan and, and the federal form selection, you know, it, it's early stages, but every little step is, is a great first step. So uh, really happy to see where it's going as well from, from the underwriting side. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the market overall. And, and, and you know, these are, these are market-specific uh, things, not specific to Chubb. But, um, you know, when we look at the chart that Kevin had put up earlier about security class actions, uh, and you can see the rise in security class actions that happened starting in 2016 and making their way upwards through 17, 18, and 19. Um, that was on the heels of what was really, in some substance, a, a particularly long, soft market that ran for you know, roughly 15 years. Um, you know, we, in 2016, we started to see this uptick, and we were really hopeful it was just an aberration. Uh, and then the next three years sort of outdid each other one after the other. Um, and it really became you know, clear that we're probably looking at, you know, something along the lines of a new normal. Um, at this point, you know, the carriers started realizing that, oh, my gosh, we have a lot of claims, an influx of claims, and there's an expectation that these claims are going to be more expensive than the ones that came before them. 
a lot to do with the size of the market cap loss, which is a really good barometer for overall settlements. When uh, we, we look at these cases that started coming in, um, you know, it, it made the industry take a step back and, and, and think about the premium that we've collected over the last 15 years in that relatively soft market and just realize that we were not being paid appropriately for the risk that we were taking. taking. And, um, you know, something needed to change. And so in 2018, and again, roughly in 2018, there was a change in the market for public company p and uh, It sort of started, you know, with mid-sized companies. Um, it started on the primary, uh, with, the, with the primary getting a good deal of rate, and then it moved to the excess. Um, and the excess then started outpacing the primary because the excess uh, had been uh, – sort of uh, hit harder on the downturn uh, in the software market. It then sort of started to move to the, mi it migrated to the larger account space about a year later. Um, and again, that went from primary to excess. Um, and it wasn't just pricing that changed. Um, other things changed as well. For example, the security, uh, the, the SIRs or self-insured retention started increasing, which was an interesting thing because if you looked at retention, they had stayed relatively stable over that 15 year period. Um, and if you looked at the cost of the associated with these litigations, it was growing exponentially over that same time period. Um, so in, uh, uh, retention started increasing over that time. Carriers started reducing limits. Uh, they wanted to mitigate their exposure to, to industries and to companies. Uh, it came in the form of reducing the size of each layer they were putting out, or in certain circumstances, uh, putting out fewer layers on the same program. And then even in more recent times, we started to see some curtailing of, of, of terms and conditions um, that were the product of the software market. It migrated uh, from just full cover ABC uh, DNO to A side DNO. Um, there's been an increase in derivative claims uh, and subsequently larger derivative settlements. Uh, and more recently, it started to migrate into other lines of business, including fiduciary, employment practices, crime, and otherwise. Uh, and those lines have also started to see uh, an increase in litigation as well. Um, then you have COVID hitting, um, and, and you know, that, that's uh, for the reasons we talked earlier. Um, although there's been this lull, the expectation is there will be more uh, claims that are associated with COVID or just, or just generally. Um, and so you, you now have an environment where that, the market as it is is extending further. Um, and you're seeing industries that are particularly hard hit by the COVID environment uh, coming out of particular scrutiny, including travel and leisure, real estate, airlines, retail, et cetera. Um, so, you know, wh where are we today? Um, you know, there's a good deal of general volatility in the overall stock market, which is not good for DNO, uh, not good for DNO carriers, not good for insureds. Um, you know, we had a large amount, you got to remember those claims from 17, 18, and 19, which were the high water marks, came at a time where the market was doing particularly well. Uh, not what we normally expect in a good environment. Uh, so now that you've added in this, this um, volatility that COVID's created, uh, you know, the expectation is you would see an increase in claims. Um, you know, the DNO industry uh, is, is still uh, in a state of recovery from the 15 years of the market being what it was and for the last three years of claims and now 2020, the claims where they are. Um, you know, when you look at the world as it was pre-COVID, um, you know, there was an increased level of SDA with more extensive claims. You had the, uh, the, the sort of proliferation of event-driven risk, um, and, you know, that, that created a, a new type or at least a new moniker for a type of claim that was coming uh, related to uh, uh, events that happened to companies. And now, after COVID, you know, we have to kind of look at that. We're adding COVID-related claims. We have broader economic concerns. We have political unrest, we have civil unrest, bankruptcies that we talked about earlier. We're talking, we talked about the diversity risk earlier. And now we are also adding to that the, the, the um, additional uh, exposure to the other lines of business. For example, the excessive fee cases in fiduciary, uh, BIPA and other sort of discriminatory claims and Me Too claims and employment practices and social engineering and crime. Um, so, you know, that's where we are today. We're not seeing the things quite yet uh, that generally predate a market changing. We're not seeing any massive increase in competition for layers. We're not seeing uh, a lot of carriers who are in the market putting up more capacity on average. Uh, we're not seeing pricing decreasing. 
Um, and we're really not seeing any material new, mar new capital coming into the market. So when you look at the environment, uh, you know, I think the expectation is uh, that, that the market will continue on the path that it is currently at for, for at least a little while longer. Um, one of the things I did want to talk about in this environment is what, what you should expect from your underwriters in this environment. Um, I think one of the things that's really important, and I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about diversity, is expect more questions. Um, this is a time, a, a, a really different time in companies' life cycles than we've seen in, in, in probably in my lifetime and many people's lifetime, um, you know, where there, the COVID and, uh, pandemic has hit very hard, um, where there's a, a big change in the way companies are doing business. And so I think you can expect to, to get more questions about not only diversity, which is, you know, from the current environment that we're operating in, um, in terms of the social unrest, but also in terms of liquidity, your balance sheet strength, access to capital, your long-term prospects for your business, um, disclosure. We talked about disclosure. What are your disclosure practices? Um, you know, who, who, who's reviewing your disclosures before they go out? Um, have you changed your disclosure practices as a result of COVID? Um, supply chain flexibility. Some companies had a really hard time in the early stages of COVID related to their supply chain. They couldn't put out a product because they couldn't get the components that they needed to make their product. Um, cyber controls in a, in a work from home environment, your revenue predictability, how you plan for disaster, including pandemic, uh, how that's changed. Um, and, and just, you know, to, to put it bluntly, we're on a public company basis, we're having client calls with virtually all of our clients. Um, so it's a great opportunity uh, for the underwriting community to get the opportunity to talk to other clients the people who really know the business and really get a sense to understand um, what, what they're doing in that environment. So um, I'll, I'll open it up to the others on the panel to, to comment on the market, but I just wanted to give a quick overview of where we see it now. Well, this is Kevin. I'll, I'll go ahead um, and, and kind of pick up where uh, Jared left off, which is talking about um, the different underwriting environments. Uh, you know, one of the things we're telling our um, our clients is whatever their expectations are based on prior experience about how um, their re insurance renewal is going to unfold, they need to set those expectations aside because um, the process now is uh, much more time consuming, much more labor intensive, and much more unpredictable. And, um, you know, we can all make generalizations about the impact on the marketplace as a whole, but when it comes down to a specific company, how that particular company is going to experience the current environment is going to depend on a lot. It's going to depend on um, its industry. It's going to depend on its history, particularly claims history, its financial condition, on how the pandemic has affected business operations. And so you can make um, marketplace statements about uh, certain types of percentage increases, but particular companies for example, I represent a commercial bank that has had an unfortunate claims development over the last year. Well, it saw its price increase, uh, its total um, cost of insurance increase by over 100%. And that sounds horrible, but actually we were extremely grateful that we got it done at all because right up until the last minute, it wasn't clear that it was going to get done. Um, so it, it's a very different process than in, in the past. And as Jared alluded to it, there are new um, suspect classes, um, travel, hospitality, retail, oil and gas. Um, and um, those are being uh, treated very differently than they were in prior periods. And all companies are, as Jared alluded to, seeing much more underwriting. Um, and most of the public company DNO underwriters now have questionnaires that can be quite lengthy and um, quite um, time consuming to complete. Um, and um, so it's, it's just a, a, a very different process. And also, Jared alluded to the fact that we are seeing a pullback on some terms and conditions, not across the board and not necessarily in, in all the most important places, but, and, you know, if there were no other sign that we're in a hard market, that's probably one of the surest that when they start taking away some of the soft market uh, coverage extensions, that's clearly a sign um, that the carriers are pulling back. And I agree with Jared. I don't see anything on the horizon immediately that suggests certainly um, in 2020 and even early in 2021, we're going to see any let up. So we are trying to um, 
forewarn our insurers that even though they, they went through a tough renewal in 2020, they probably need to expect a tough one in 2021 as well. Priya, what are you seeing? Um, <laughs> puppies and rainbows? No, I am not. Um, it is, <laughs> there is, there is no doubt that it's a tough environment. And I will tell you uh, this, you know, my observation is that in a lot of ways, um, from a broking perspective, it's better in October 2020 than it was in January for this reason. Um, all of my competitors um, are saying the same thing. It's really tough. You got to start early. Nobody's getting a decrease. Um, it, and I say that because different, as, as you said so well, Kevin, different companies have different risk profiles, different experiences. And as things started to get hard at the end of 18 and 2019, you would still go into boardrooms and have some board members say, well, I don't know why it's so expensive. This is outrageous. Um, now that has, in my world, nobody is saying that anymore. And if they say that, that's the guy that's not paying attention. Uh, but the new thing people say is, well, I should start an insurance company as if the entire insurance industry is bad at its job. Like, it's absurd. Um, it's actually offensive. I practice that professional woman smile that all professional women know how to do when people say ridiculous things like that. Um, and it's very frustrating. And my hope for our industry, and I mean brokers and carriers, is that we handle the tough times extremely well. Because what's happening now is generating tremendous cynicism from our buyers. And, and it, it gets expressed, right, by you know, reports of two billionaires for two different companies opting out of insurance altogether. Now, that's really weird. And let's put that aside as anomalies. But there's a reason that that's happening. I think that in a world where carriers tell their brokers, um, yeah, we're your primary, but we're not going to give you terms other than 30 days out, is not enhancing the reputation of the insurance industry writ large. Then the broker looks ridiculous in front of their clients. The broker will inevitably be very tempted to blame the carrier, and it looks bad. And if on top of that, our carriers are on a blanket basis saying, or attempting COVID-19 exclusions or bankruptcy exclusions for anybody in distress, you get into this terrible situation where every, every buyer's dark and cynical suspicions of the entire insurance industry now seems to be coming true. And I think the an antidote, antidote, excuse me, easy for me to say, the antidote for that is early communication, including of bad news with clear transparency. And one, one of the things I think about is that if you have to deliver bad news as a broker to a client or as a carrier to the broker, don't just kind of mince around and say it under your breath, you know, make a fist and, you know, put your shoulders and swing your hips into it. Be really clear. This is the situation. We know it's terrible. Um, but the worst thing is not being, not giving terms in a timely way, uh, not being clear about what, what, what is, what's the expectation and the process. Um, I know early on in COVID-19, and I was very sympathetic, a lot of carriers kept coming up with new questionnaires. And I understood why that was happening. And I would never presume to tell carriers how to run their business, but the impact for clients was just drove a huge amount of cynicism and it's it's terrible it's a tough time and people who are knowledgeable and can read financial statements know carriers aren't you know running to the bank with dollar bills falling out of sacks of cash um, and if as an industry we can be clear about the data and the why and the expectations you know frankly i think when you know jared when carriers ask a lot of questions clients actually feel better. I don't actually think they feel, it's not a colonoscopy, it's actually an opportunity for them to differentiate themselves. So even in a really bad time, there are ways where as an entire industry, we can behave that enhances um, our relationships with clients. And, and a phrase that I use a lot is, you know, the insurance industry 
supports corporate America by putting capital behind directors and officers, that is a worthy goal. And I just hate anything that scores against the actual very, very good work that we do as an industry. You know, Priya, yeah, I, I, you, the one thing I would say, and, and I, I agree, um, you know, and is that I think that holds true in any market, uh, whether it's it's the ones we had from you know, 2003 to 2018 or the one that we're in now. Um, I, I think the communication is key. We try to do our best uh, you know, to do that early and often. Uh, you know, we, we hold events for our clients to have discussions, so on and so forth. Um, but I, but I, I think the same holds true in, in, in any of the, any type of market we have. Uh, that communication is key, and you know, uh, up, being upfront is key, and making ourselves available to have those conversations with anyone who will listen. Uh, you know, happy to do that. Yeah, I, I do feel like my job is a lot of being yelled at, but that's okay, right? <laughs> Customer service. That's what we do. I feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Um, but anyway, but I, I think we're we're almost at our time, so I, I don't know uh, if we want to move on to questions. Yeah, or? so uh, we have we have about four minutes left, um, and just quickly, uh, if there are any uh, new questions, uh, there have been several questions that have come in uh, during the course of the uh, panel, and we have and there have been answers to several of them, but. Are there, if there are any new questions, we probably have time for one or two. Otherwise, uh, we'll, we will adjourn. As a reminder, folks, to ask a question via the web presentation, just type your question into the text box on your screen. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not seeing any new ones. Um, are you, Jenny? No, no new questions. All right, so I uh, I think uh, with that, uh, now there's three minutes left. Let us, uh, I think it's time to adjourn. I'd like to thank all the panelists who were great. Uh, I think the uh, what was covered here uh, was is that very valuable to uh, various constituencies that have signed up for this. Uh, for this program and uh, you all did a great job and I thank you and uh, I thank the audience for signing up and I hope uh, I hope that you uh, found it as useful as I did. Uh, and with that, uh, let's wrap up. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for attending. <laughs>